Hey everyone, this is going to be a pulmonology review for step one. I'm mainly going to be following the outline laid out by First Aid, but I'm really going to be trying to pick out the high yield facts for you guys and show you guys some examples of how they like to test these concepts on your step one exam. I'm going to be breaking this video into two parts. It's going to be a physiology video and the second part is going to be a pathology video. So starting out with physiology, we have lung development, and there's five stages of lung development as shown here. In first aid, they have this mnemonic, every pulmonologist can see alveoli. But I really think there's just a few key things you want to take away from this first section in first aid. So the first thing is that embryologically, the lungs start out as the lung bud, and then develops distally over time. Uh, and another key fact that they sometimes like to test is that the lung continues to develop after birth. So if you look here, uh, you see that there's this amount of alveoli uh, after birth, but all the way going up to eight years, you're still developing more and more alveoli. Uh, and then the biggest fact that they really like to test is that respiration becomes possible at the end of the canalicular stage, and that's around week 25. So if there's any stage you want to remember, uh, I would say you should really focus on the canalicular stage and know that respiration first becomes possible at that time. There's a few ways that they like to test abnormal lung development. So you may see a question where you see this baby with a bunch of what looks like gas in their uh, chest, and it's actually bowel gas. And this is a congenital diaphragmatic hernia. And the really key term that they like to test for this is that there's a defective formation of the pleuroperitoneal membrane. So usually, you know, we just say yeah, there's a defect in the diaphragm, right? But uh, they like this really fancy terminology, and I think if you see it for the first time, you're not going to know what they're talking about. But if you look at it, pleuroperitoneal, it makes sense. Okay, that's like the diaphragm connecting the pleura and the peritoneum. So just make sure you know this terminology refers to a defect in the diaphragm. They may show you a picture of a baby that looks like this, or they may describe a baby who has a flattened nose and twisted extremities uh, and lung hypoplasia. And that would be Potter sequence, which is due to oligohydramnios, which is decreased amniotic fluid. So one of the big ways that this happens is if the baby has kidney problems, for example, bilateral renal agenesis. The, that causes the baby to not really pee into the amniotic fluid. And then they're not able to swallow amniotic fluid, which helps develop the lungs. And also because there's no amniotic fluid, they get all compressed inside the uterus, which causes these, this uh constellation of findings, the lung hypoplasia, the twisted face and body, and the flattened nose. Okay, next let's talk about the respiratory tree. Uh, there's two important parts. There's the conducting zone and there's the respiratory zone. So the conducting zone, there's no gas exchange. This is just helping the air get down to your alveoli, which is then where you have these capillaries which can receive oxygen. Um, it's important to know that one of the key epithelial types here is the pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. And then as you go distally, the epithelium gets smaller. So it goes from the pseudostratified ciliated to simple ciliated, cuboidal, and then simple squamous. One cell that they sometimes like to talk about is the club cell, which uh, functions to clear toxins. It secretes a surfactant-like product and acts as a stem cell. So they may ask you about this, and you can see the club cells are kind of located both within the conducting zone as well as in the respiratory bronchioles. Next slide is talking about how type 2 pneumocytes are important. So I just wrote here, type 1 pneumocytes are boring, okay? Type 1 pneumocytes participate in gas exchange, but other than that, they don't really do anything. But the NBME always loves to test type 2 pneumocytes. So there's several functions of the type 2 pneumocytes. The most important ones is that it secretes surfactant, and also they act as a stem cell and proliferate during lung damage. Okay, so if they tell you that somebody has lung injury and what cell is going to be responsible for repairing this lung injury, that's going to be the type 2 pneumocytes. Uh, another thing that the NBME is absolutely obsessed with is the lamellar bodies, which are inside type 2 pneumocytes, and that's where surfactant is stored and secreted. So make sure you know the lamellar bodies. And then finally, we have the alveolar macrophages, which clean toxins that get down to the alveoli. For example, they clear toxins from people who smoke. Here's just some example questions that I have. These are Anki flashcards that I made uh, every time I had an incorrect 
UWorld question. So for example, how does idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis alter type 1 and type 2 pneumocyte levels? Okay, so you have loss of type 1 pneumocytes and you have hyperplasia of type 2 pneumocytes. Again, that's because they're like the stem cell of the lung and they're trying to repair this damage from IPF. What cell is responsible for regenerating the alveolar lining after injury? That's type 2 pneumocytes. Um, and then again, here is a question about the lamellar bodies. What structural change is seen in type 2 pneumocytes in premature babies with neonatal respiratory distress syndrome? They have decreased number of lamellar bodies, which means they have less surfactant, and that's why the babies have uh, respiratory distress syndrome. So surfactant, let's just go through this quickly. Surfactant deficiency in a premature baby causes what problem? The answer to that would be neonatal respiratory distress syndrome. C-section deliveries actually increase the risk of having neonatal RDS. The reason is because going through the vaginal canal in a normal vaginal birth is very stressful and you know the, ba the baby's head is getting compressed, it's a long process, and so they release a lot of cortisol which helps more surfactant be secreted and helps the lungs mature a little bit. With, with a C-section delivery, however, it's relatively stress-free for the baby. They come out very quickly and they don't release that cortisol, so they don't have that same kind of surfactant and lung development uh, from the cortisol. The treatment for neonatal respiratory distress syndrome is steroids before birth exogenous surfactant and supplemental O2. And really important to know are the complications of neonatal RDS. Uh, so these are the three big ones, retinopathy of prematurity, intraventricular hemorrhage, and bronchopulmonary dysplasia. So the most common way, this one gets tested all the time, you're gonna have a baby who is born premature, they have respiratory distress, so they're put on O2, and now all of a sudden the test question will say, you notice some abnormal blood vessel growth in their eye. That is retinopathy of prematurity, and that is due to the supplemental O2 that they're being treated with. Intraventricular hemorrhage is really just a complication of being born premature. You have your ventricles in your brain, um, and there's these germinal matrices that when you're premature, these germinal matrices still have a lot of vessels within them, and if you're born premature, they can rupture and cause an intraventricular hemorrhage. Uh, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, this is going to be an infant who has RDS and they get intubated and now you eventually extubate them but they still have all these lung problems and breathing problems and that's because the entire process of getting intubated has led to their lungs not really developing normally uh, so they get bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Okay, next question. What is the screening test for fetal lung maturity? The answer to that would be the lecithin sphingomyelin ratio. And again, you're looking for an L to S ratio of greater than 2 to 1 to signify fetal lung maturity. Here are just some pictures of the complications of neonatal RDS. Here is retinopathy of prematurity. And again, you're going to see the abnormal growth of blood vessels in the retina because of the supplemental O2 treatment. Here is what intraventricular hemorrhage looks like. On your step 1 exam, they may just give you a picture. Uh, and you'll see this hyperdensity in one of their ventricles. And again, this is because they have bleeding due to an immature germinal matrix. And here is just a depiction of bronchopulmonary dysplasia. You can see this patient has an endotracheal tube in. Their lungs just look very uh, underdeveloped, and they get this bronchopulmonary dysplasia because of their intubation. Here's the L to S ratio. As you can see, the less thin grows over time, while the sphingomyelin kind of stays constant. And once you reach this point where the ratio of L to S is greater than 2 to 1, that means the fetus's lungs are fairly mature. Here's just some example questions. One of these questions, for example, how is fetal lung maturity measured in amniotic fluid, the less than sphingomyelin ratio? One of the things to note about this question is that they actually, instead of saying lecithin, they talked about phosphatidylcholine. You should know that that's another name for lecithin. So they could ask you about the phosphatidylcholine sphingomyelin ratio. And then here, oxygen supplementation in a newborn may cause what abnormality in the retina? That would be neurovascularization, otherwise known as retinopathy of prematurity. Okay, next I want to talk about the law of Laplace. The MBME actually really likes testing this concept, and the way they like testing it is to show you a diagram of two spheres representing alveoli, and they ask you whether the larger sphere or the smaller sphere is more likely to collapse. And the answer is actually the smaller sphere is more likely to collapse. Imagine if you had two balloons and one is blown up to this size 
and one is blown up only to this size, which one is harder to blow up? It's, it's this balloon on the right here because its collapsing pressure is still higher. And the reason for that is because the smaller radius causes the collapsing pressure to be higher in smaller spheres. Now to kind of counteract this, you have surfactant which helps reducing the surface tension and the collapsing pressure. So that's one of the reasons surfactant is so important is because it can help prevent smaller alveoli from just collapsing because of the law of Laplace. Okay, just going quickly through lung anatomy, you should know that there's three lobes to the right lung and two lobes to the left lung, and that the right main stem bronchus is not only wider, but it's also kind of straighter than the left main stem bronchus, so it's a lot easier to have aspirates or foreign bodies go down the right main stem bronchus, and they'll end up as some kind of pneumonia or obstruction in the right lower lung. So the way that they're going to test this concept is they're going to show you a chest x-ray of somebody with a pneumonia in their right lower lung, and then in their history you find out that the patient is an alcoholic, or they had altered mental status, or dementia, or some other reason that they have aspiration pneumonia, and really what they're trying to get at is uh, this right lower lung infiltrate is an aspiration pneumonia, and a lot of times that is going to be consisting of normal aura flora, uh, which is causing that uh, lung infiltrate down there. Next let's quickly go over the diaphragm structures. So there's the mnemonic that I think a lot of you guys know. Uh, it's I ate 10 eggs at 12 and this basically tells you where each of these structures passes through the diaphragm. So the IVC passes through at T8, esophagus at T10, and aorta at T12. The thing is these are pretty basic and I think a lot of people already know this, so it's unlikely that they're actually going to test you on these specific ones. And I thought it was pretty f uh, low yield to learn these other small, smaller structures that pass through the diaphragm, but then they ended up actually testing those when I was uh, preparing for step one. So you should actually know that uh, along with the IVC at T8, the phrenic nerve passes through the diaphragm. With the esophagus at T10, the vagus nerve passes through, and the thoracic duct and azagus vein pass through with the aorta at T12. I thought those were low yield, but again, they did actually end up testing those uh, when I was studying. You should know that pain from the diaphragm refers to the right shoulder, uh, and that is due to innervation by C3, 4, and 5. Okay, let's go over some basic respiratory physiology. This is a very high yield concept and you're going to get several questions on this on your step one exam, so you have to know it pretty well. Let's just go over the lung volumes here on this lung volume curve. So here is just kind of a normal inspiration and expiration. What volume is that? That would be the tidal volume. Okay, if you took a tidal volume inspiration and then you inspired as much as you could, that would be the inspiratory reserve volume. And if you went from expiration to a full expiration, that would be the expiratory reserve volume. And then finally at the bottom here, you have this residual amount of air that you can't blow out even if you expire as forcefully as possible, and that would be your residual volume. Okay, it's also important to know the different lung capacities. So if you have the entire lung capacity from here down to here, that would be the total lung capacity. Okay. Uh, another thing that's important is the volume from a full inspiration to a maximal expiration, and that would be the vital capacity. And finally, the volume left over from a tidal volume expiration, so all the way down here, that is your functional reserve capacity. So these are the three important ones you need to know. Vital capacity, total lung capacity, and f FRC. Okay, this one wasn't depicted on the graphs here, but what is FEV1? FEV1 is the forced expiratory volume in one second, and this is really helpful because it helps us identify patients with obstructive versus restrictive lung diseases. So a, a low FEV1, would that be more indicative of an obstructive lung disease or a restrictive lung disease? The answer would be both obstructive and restrictive lung diseases, and I'll show you a graph depicting this in just a moment. So what if you had high total lung capacity? Is that more obstructive or restrictive? That is obstructive. And what if you had a low FEV1 to FVC ratio? That again is an obstructive pattern. 
And I think this graph is a very, very useful graph. You can see that normal is depicted in green here, obstructive lung disease in blue, and restrictive lung disease in orange. This is basically the volume they're able to breathe out on a full expiration. And the maximum amount they're able to breathe out is the forced vital capacity. And the amount they're able to breathe out in one second is the FEV1 depicted here. So as you can see here, normal looks like this. Obstructive uh, actually reaches a fairly similar FVC, but the amount they're able to expire in one second is significantly diminished compared to a normal lung. So that's why they have such a decreased FEV1 over FVC ratio. Uh, so a normal FEV1 over FVC ratio is about 4 liters over 5 liters, which is about 80%. If you look here, the FEV1 here for the obstructive lung disease patient is probably like 2.5 liters over 5 liters, so only 50%. Now for restrictive lung disease, however, they have a decreased FEV1 as well. However, their FVC is also significantly decreased compared to normal. So when you end up actually calculating their FEV1 over FVC, it's actually relatively normal in restrictive lung disease. Okay, so basically, high lung volumes plus a low FEV1 over FVC is an obstructive lung disease, and low lung volumes plus a normal FEV1 over FVC is a restrictive lung disease. You should know this like the back of your hand, and for the exam, it'll only take you a few seconds to, to answer this. Um, and it's going to be tested many ways, but one of the ways they really like to test this concept is they'll just give you TLC, VC, uh, FVC, FEV1 over FVC, and then all the answer choices are going to be like up, up, down, and down, down, normal, something like that. So you're just going to have to know this concept and be able to pick the correct answer. So this is obstructive right here, and this would be a uh, restrictive pattern over here. Flow volume loops. So you might get this on your test. I remember reviewing this in my first aid and thinking this was kind of pointless, and I didn't really understand why they were going over it, but then I did get several questions testing this while I was studying for step one. So obstructive lung disease, normal lung disease, and restrictive lung disease. <clears throat> the odd thing about these graphs is that the numbers for the lung volume it get larger as you go to the left, and they get smaller to the right. So if you look here, this is an inspiration and expiration, and this is their total lung capacity. So again, you see that this is shifted to the left, which means they have a higher lung capacity. That's an obstructive pattern. On the other hand, restrictive lung disease has smaller lung volumes, so if it's shifted to the right, this is a restrictive pattern. So you might get a basic question on this on your test, and you just have to know what these graphs are and what they are representing, and it should be a very easy question for you to get. So let's talk about dead space. There's two types of physiologic dead space. There's anatomic dead space and alveolar dead space. And dead space is basically referring to places where gas exchange is not occurring. So the first type, anatomic dead space, is basically the conducting zone of your respiratory tree where there's no capillaries that would receive any gas exchange. So that's anatomic dead space. Uh, another type of dead space you have is the alveolar dead space, and this is generally at the top of your lungs where you have a lot of ventilation, so you have a lot of gas up there, but because it's so superior, you don't have very good perfusion or blood flow to that area. So you have a lot of ventilation with no perfusion. That causes a dead space where there's no gas exchange. Now first aid presents these complicated equations, and I remember trying to force myself to memorize them, but I don't think I was ever tested on some of these equations. They have this mnemonic for this one, taco, paco, pico, paco. I would say that you know, kind of be aware of the concept, but I don't think you really need to memorize these equations uh, and spend too much time doing that. So let's talk about VQ mismatch now. It's a very, very important concept to understand because so many things cause VQ mismatch. And it's relatively simple, but I feel like when I was learning it, it wasn't fully explained very well. So V equals ventilation and Q equals perfusion. And now I just want to go over a normal lung with you guys and see test you guys uh, for this concept. So is VQ high or low here? So here, as I mentioned earlier, ventilation would be high, but perfusion is low because it takes more pressure for the blood to get this superior, um, and gravity is pulling it down. So you have high ventilation and low perfusion, so this ratio is high. In fact, at the very top of the lung, you have 
high ventilation and zero perfusion, as I mentioned earlier. So that causes VQ to be infinity, because remember, if you divide by zero, you get infinity. And whenever your VQ is infinity, that's called dead space. There's no gas exchange happening there. And how about here? Is it, in the base of the lungs, is VQ high or low here? So here you have pretty high ventilation. Um, it's actually higher than up here at the apex of the lung. But you also have high perfusion. So if you have high ventilation, but it's being divided by a high perfusion, you end up with a relatively lower VQ ratio at the base. So this is important for a lot of pathologies that can happen because a lot of different things can cause VQ mismatch. Um, so let's just start with this example here. Say you have a pulmonary embolism right here, and it travels distally and lodges in one of the pulmonary arteries. It's effectively cutting off perfusion to all these distal parts of the lung. So what kind of VQ mismatch are you going to have here? So you have basically no perfusion, but you have uh, completely unimpeded ventilation because the, nothing is blocking the bronchi from delivering oxygen to the alveoli. Okay, so what you get with the pulmonary embolism is you have normal ventilation with zero perfusion that causes a VQ of infinity, also known as dead space. Now another example, let's say you have a pneumonia in this area, or you have pulmonary edema or uh, foreign body aspiration that's causing a blockage here. And basically this is compressing all the alveoli and compressing your bronchi so air can't get there. Okay, so basically you will have no ventilation, but nothing is impeding the perfusion, so you have a VQ of zero. So again, ventilation is zero, perfusion is normal. So if ventilation is zero, and that's divided by a certain perfusion, then that gets uh, a ratio of zero. And this is also known as shunt. So it's really important that you know that when it's all ventilation and no perfusion, that's called dead space. And if it's no ventilation and all perfusion, that's called shunt. Okay, because in the answer choices, they may ask you about dead space and shunt rather than just saying VQ mismatch. They're both certain types of VQ mismatch, but they're a little bit more specific. Okay, another important thing to note is that the body's response to shunt is called hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. Basically, you have no ventilation in this area, and the body kind of realizes that there's no point in sending blood down here because it's not going to get any oxygen. So they'll start constricting the blood vessels and uh, allowing the blood to flow to other areas that are more well ventilated. And that's called hypoxic pulmonary constriction. One important thing to know is that dead space uh, with a VQ of infinity responds to 100% O2 and a shunt does not respond to 100% O2. There's some fairly good YouTube videos explaining why this is if you are interested. But basically, if you gave somebody 100% oxygen and they had a foreign body right here in this bronchus, that 100% oxygen is not going to be getting down to this area, so giving them 100% oxygen doesn't really help. Whereas if somebody has a PE, all their blood is going to be going to these different areas, and they're going to get minor VQ mismatches as well. So when you give 100% oxygen, it actually helps uh, balance the VQ mismatch a little bit better to these other areas. The next concept that the MBME likes to test is that the lung likes to collapse, whereas the chest wall likes to expand. And that's depicted on this diagram here, where you can see the lung trying to go inwards and the chest trying to expand outwards. And what this does, it actually creates a vacuum in the space in between the lung and the chest, which is called the intrapleural space. And this causes the intrapleural pressure to be negative five millimeters of mercury compared to atmosphere. And I was actually asked this concept frequently especially about the intrapleural pressure. And the reason that the intrapleural pressure being negative is important is because it helps prevent the alveoli from collapsing uh, because there's a negative pressure on the outside uh, pulling the alveoli outwards, basically. Next, let's talk about hemoglobin. Remember that hemoglobin consists of two alpha and two beta subunits. They have two kind of characteristics you should know about. One is positive cooperativity, which means that as more oxygen binds, it increases the affinity for more oxygen. 
And the next concept is negative allosteric, which basically refers to binding of another molecule, such as 2,3-BPG, decreasing hemoglobin's affinity for its substrate, oxygen. Fetal hemoglobin, it's important to know that it consists of 2 alpha and 2 gamma subunits. It has a higher affinity for O2 than adult hemoglobin, which is important because as blood is pro crossing the placenta, you want higher affinity for oxygen so that the fetal hemoglobin can kind of take oxygen away from the maternal hemoglobin. The reason this has a higher affinity is because of decreased binding of 2,3-BPG. And as I mentioned, this allows the fetus to take oxygen from the mother across the placenta. One somewhat related question is uh, for sickle cell patients, we give them hydroxyurea. And why do we give them hydroxyurea? The answer is because it increases the amount of fetal hemoglobin, which increases their affinity for oxygen and prevents them from having their sickle cell crises. The oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve is extremely important and very high yield. You're definitely going to receive several questions on this on your exam. And basically this shows the percent of hemoglobin that's saturated as you start getting more oxygen in your blood. Okay? And the reason it has the sigmoidal shape is because of positive cooperativity. One question they do like to ask is what if hemoglobin didn't have positive cooperativity, what would it look like? And the answer would be myoglobin. You can see this myoglobin curve doesn't have that sigmoidal shape, and that's because it has no positive cooperativity. And then you really need to know what causes a left shift in the curve and a right shift in the curve. So if you look at a right shift, you'll notice that hemoglobin becomes less saturated earlier on as your oxygen decreases in the blood. Whereas if it's left shifted, hemoglobin holds on to the oxygen for longer before becoming desaturated. So the main thing to note here is that a shift to the left means that hemoglobin is holding on to oxygen more, whereas a shift to the right means that hemoglobin releases oxygen to tissues earlier. So would exercise shift the curve to the left or the right? So if you think about it, exercise is exerting a demand on your tissue and they require more oxygen. So what you would want hemoglobin to do is release oxygen to tissues earlier so your tissues don't become hypoxic as you are exercising. So exercise shifts the curve to the right. So next, increased 2,3-BPG would cause what change in the curve? So let's just briefly review what 2,3-BPG is. Basically, when your red blood cells detect tissue hypoxia, they synthesize this molecule, 2,3-BPG, which makes hemoglobin have less affinity for oxygen. And that helps deliver more oxygen to that hypoxic tissue that your red blood cells were detecting. So increased 2,3-BPG causes hemoglobin to have less affinity for oxygen, causing a right shift on the curve. An easy way to remember this is that everything that shifts the curve to the right is basically an upwards arrow. So uh, if you have increased 2,3-BPG, increased altitude, increased temperature, those all make your tissues require more oxygen, so you would want the curve to shift to the right. On the other hand, left shift, everything is decreased. So if decreased temperature, decreased 2,3-BPG, that's going to cause a shift to the left. Make sure you know this well because you are definitely going to be tested on this on your step one exam. Let's talk about hemoglobin modifications. So if you have a patient in your question stem who was taking nitrates, who now has cyanosis and symptoms of anemia, that is called methemoglobinemia. And the reason they get this is because nitrites can oxidize Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus, which does not bind oxygen as easily. The treatment for this is methylene blue. What about a patient as well as their family who start having headaches and dizziness during the winter time. And it's uh, very important to note the winter time because this is often when this presents. That's carbon monoxide poisoning from people turning on their heaters in closed spaces with poor ventilation. So carbon monoxide has a very high affinity for hemoglobin and will bind it instead of oxygen. So when your hemoglobin goes to deliver oxygen to your tissues, it can't because there's just carbon monoxide bound, bound to it. The treatment is 100% oxygen, which outcompetes the carbon monoxide. A patient in a house fire now has hypoxia and almond breath odor. That would be cyanide poisoning. 
So that's associated with house fires and associated with this almond breath odor. So the reason cyanide causes this is because it inhibits complex 4, which is involved in the production of ATP. So basically these patients have no more ATP, their diaphragm starts spasming and then stops working entirely, and then they become hypoxic. The treatment is nitrites plus thiosulfates. So the nitrites induce hemoglobinemia, and that has very high affinity for binding cyanide, which prevents it from binding complex 4. Thiosulfates, on the other hand, help excrete cyanide renally. So again, the way the NBME likes to test these concepts is just giving you a table and asking you whether things will be increased or decreased or normal. So one important thing to know is that for carbon monoxide poisoning and methemoglobinemia, your dissolved O2 is normal. Okay? The only difference is that your oxygen saturation of hemoglobin is decreased. But frequently they ask if the dissolved O2 is decreased as well, and it's not. It's just normal. Another thing to note is your pulse ox may read normal, so you might have this patient coming in with symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning. You put a pulse ox on them and it reads 100%, um, but they still have carbon monoxide poisoning. The pulse ox can't differentiate the two different types of bound hemoglobin, and that's why it still reads 100%. Here are just some example questions that I had showing that they really like to test the concept that carbon monoxide poisoning and methemoglobinemia cause no change in the partial pressure of oxygen in blood. They only affect the saturation of oxygen on hemoglobin. Next, let's talk about carbon dioxide transport. I remember when I saw this complicated looking picture in first aid, I had no idea what the take home points were. So I basically came up with five take home points that you guys should know for carbon dioxide transport. So carbon dioxide is transported in three forms, bicarbonate, 70%, carbon dioxide bound to hemoglobin, aka carbaminohemoglobin, which is 20 to 25%, and dissolved CO2, which is 5 to 9%. So the enzyme which makes this all happen is the carbonic anhydrase in red blood cells. So it's very important you know that this is how you create the bicarb that is how 70% of carbon dioxide is transported. The molecule that helps allow transport of bicarbonate outside of RBCs is chloride. So if you look here on this transporter, chloride goes into the cell, into the red blood cells, in exchange for bicarb out of these cells. So they may ask you, why is the chloride content of RBCs high? And the reason for that is because of exchange of bicarb out. Okay, the next thing you should know is that in lungs, there's a lot of oxygen which causes more carbon dioxide to be released from red blood cells. That way you can breathe off the carbon dioxide in your blood. And that is called the Haldane effect. In the peripheral tissue, you have high amounts of carbon dioxide. You also have acid. And this causes more oxygen to be released from red blood cells to supply that tissue with much needed oxygen. And that's called the Bohr effect. Now those are the main take home points for this carbon dioxide transport. You should know about the concept of perfusion versus diffusion limited gas exchange. Basically, if a gas is perfusion limited, that means it equilibrates quickly across the capillary membrane, and more gas being able to diffuse is limited by the rate of blood flow. Whereas if the gas is diffusion limited, basically the gas has a lot of trouble crossing the capillary membrane, and the main limit to more diffusion is the permeability of the membrane itself. So this graph below shows you that normally oxygen is perfusion limited, and carbon dioxide is perfusion limited. When you start having fibrosis, however, for example, in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, oxygen starts to become diffusion limited. So imagine in this capillary membrane that's interfacing with the type 1 pneumocyte, you start getting all this fibrotic material. This makes it so the oxygen has a more difficult time diffusing across the membrane, which causes it to become, instead of perfusion limited, it's now diffusion limited. CO is the diffusion capacity of the lung for carbon monoxide, which is a surrogate for oxygen. Fibrosis and emphysema are both causes of decreased DLCO. Here's some random low yield stuff. Again, these are the crazy equations that I put way too much effort into trying to memorize and then never got tested on them. But basically I think the one thing that you should note is uh, for pulmonary vascular resistance, know that resistance is divided by the radius to the fourth power. So if you have the radius of somebody's pulmonary artery, for example, you will increase the resistance by 16 times. Because
That concludes the first part of pulmonary physiology. Next, we're going to be going over pulmonary pathology, where I will be going over a lot of common ways that questions will be presented to you for various respiratory pathologies.